Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 520, featuring an interview with True Gaming Royalty. Yes, finally, I have managed to successfully get Ken and Roberta Williams right here on Matt Chat, and it is going to be awesome. Thanks, of course, to Matt Bradley Shurgy for doing the legwork on getting this uh, interview lined up. Uh, but hey, we've got a lot to cover here. The, uh, uh, they'll be talking about Colossal Cave 3D, uh, Ken's book about the, uh, his time at Sierra, all the history behind that, uh, the, <laughs> the good and the bad. Uh, and my thoughts on modern technology, where the games industry is going, uh, fairy tales, just so many uh, great stories in this interview. So without further ado, here is Ken and Roberta Williams. Fashionably late, I guess. No, so, so glad you could join. Hi. Okay, I can probably repoint the camera so it's not just at the top of our heads. Is that better or worse? That's about how it's worse. You probably got that looks good. Okay. Good. But you gotta slide that way or we're not centered. <laughs> there we go. It's Valentine's Day. You got to sit close to me. Oh yeah. Oh, Valentine's well, Day. We've Thank got you. armrests, arm armchairs in the way. Okay. Uh, no. I like it yeah, a little bit. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. Thanks for joining me. I mean, true gaming royalty, right here. Here we are. <laughs> here we are. I'm humbled. I'm honored. We're so, here. Yeah, I was thinking though. You know, you had mentioned it is Valentine's Day. I thought, thought a fun question would be just as you're probably one of the most <laughs> beloved couples in all of uh, gaming history, and, really. And, uh, very, <laughs> and very romantic. Very. I mean, well, maybe later. Together. <laughs> so romantic. <laughs> you buy a lot you. of time together in a boat, you know. Thank you. <laughs> so do you have tips for people that are trying to manage their <laughs> relationships and yet be part of this crazy industry? Gosh. <sighs> well, one one well, island pie is hap, happy wife, happy life. No, let's well, see. I think that's a stupid phrase. No, it's a true phrase. <laughs> it's a stupid <laughs> phrase. You just but, stay out of trouble and you can stay married. In fact, I just like stop <laughs> it. It's no, I just, you know, I mean, it's I guess it would be for any marriage, you know, is basically um, you know, marriage is a partnership. It should be a partnership, you know, equal between the two partners, whoever they are. And, um, and that it is, there's always compromises, you, you know, it, it's, uh, it's never one sided, one side or the other. It's a compromise. You work things out. Um, you have fun too. Mm. Um, and you enjoy the times you have fun. And when, when you have hard times, you work them out together, you try, um, disagreements, you, again, you, you work them that work them out and you try not to ever go to bed angry. That one's the hardest to do, but that always is the best if you can. And then kiss and makeup. I stand by my answer. <laughs> okay. Well, can I just finish reading your book? Uh oh. It's up all night reading that. Wow. Just, uh, Thank you. I, I hope you like, liked it. Well, I thought it was fantastic. I mean, yeah. If um, anybody interested, I think I should probably thank you for writing it because it's, I'm sure people that are trying to write histories, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, like what was this thing? They're going to find this invaluable. I um. Well, it was sad at times. I, <laughs> if I've known it was going to do as well as it did, I would have taken it more seriously and had a real editor. And uh, I, think, I think the way he did it was fine because um, it was a, a more personal. Oh, absolutely. It, it, rather than being you know, so professionally polished and put together. I mean, no offense, but. Yeah, no one's ever accused it of being professionally polished it, and put together. More from the heart, I guess, yeah. and uh, feelings and that you actually feel and felt. But it sold really well mm -hmm. to, my, to my, yeah, complete surprise, which is why we decided to do another game. That uh, oh, sure. we realized there were a lot of Sierra people still out there. Yeah. Partially the reason, anyway. And it was such a brutally honest book, too, I felt like. You didn't try to make yourself look good or, you know, sugarcoat <laughs> yeah. anything. I mean, it was really frank. I mean, you know, I kept thinking to myself as I'm reading this, 
I don't know what I would have done in those situations. I mean, it's just like tough, a lot of tough uh, decisions you had to make. And... Yeah, well, yep. not a popularity contest. You got to kind of do what you got to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, well, um, I had a crazy thought about this, Roberta Williams, but I don't know where you want to begin. Oh, we've already begun. Oh, All we right. have. Oh, okay. <laughs> Just jump right in. Oh, well, then I'll sit up. Yeah, you better. <laughs> <laughs> we'll both sit up. Yeah, it never, there we go. It never begins. It never ends. It just continues. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, had a, I, was, I was wondering if you'd ever thought about, uh, instead of writing a book about it, making a game about it. I don't think that would be a very fun game. I mm. one thing that I have to think about as a game designer is fun. <laughs> you know, I have to think about fun. And uh and if if you know if you ask the question, is it fun? And the answer seems to be, well, it might be more interesting, or maybe you'll learn something or whatever. I don't think that's as good of an answer as, yeah, it's fun. No, I, so I don't think a, a game about our book is fun, personally. <laughs> I've thought about a game about game development, or um, you know, they say that you know, virtually every kid, you know, sixteen years old, dreams of being a game developer. Mm. So if you write something that kind of targets that group, then you get probably lots of revenue. So in a way, you'll kind of kind of flow backwards from. Uh, what you could do to teach game development to all those wannabe game developers out there. And, um, but, but, does that but sound now fun? that you got to design the game. Well, I mean, we had our Dr. Brain series that you know, yeah. I'd always dreamed of doing an adventure game in which you had to like write little bits of code or something to solve the problems. I think that could be fun. Well, I think you're onto something there. But we well, shall see. I don't know. For now, I mean, we don't even know if we're going to do another game. We just finished this one and um, are, are kind of in the resting period after uh, two years of um, working on Actually, Flopsil Cave. More like two and a half years. Yeah, it uh, consumed our lives. It consumed us. And we... I think it still is to a certain extent. Yeah, I mean, yeah. there's still some stuff happening. We're working now on... Um, I have the uh, Vision Pro headset behind me. Oh, sure. And that's because we're... Um, trying to think about how to redefine the game for um, mixed reality, not just um, virtual reality or immersive reality, whatever you want to call it. And um, so that's that's the current project. And we're also, I think, working on demos for the game for various platforms. So it just doesn't, uh, doesn't yeah, it just end. doesn't end. And, you know, and there's uh, updates. I mean, the, the one of the things that's a little different now than it was you know, back in the day of Sierra, is basically once we shipped a game, it would. It, I'm I'm not gonna say it was done. I mean, it, sometimes there were some ports to do you know, to some other other um, devices, but generally it was kind of done. You know, we shipped it. Okay, there it is. And in in unless there was some big bug or something that had to be fixed, generally it was sort of done, and we're on to the next. And mm -hmm. that's kind of the way it went. But with this game and what we're discovering, the way the game development is today is it, it's never really over <laughs> you know you sort of there's updates there's new devices coming out like this you know and you you go oh well no we've got to do that you know we've got to put it on that and because that's the new thing and so how do we do that and you and or just uh as w there's just so much more information coming between players and and us as the developers as to what they think, what they like, what they don't like, and um, maybe ideas they may have, and and we and we think, oh, that's a good idea, you know, maybe we should do that. You go know, back into the game, you know, we kind of change this, twiddle with that, you do that, and we never really did that before because you know we're talking twenty five or or more years ago that we didn't have the same um, opportunity to hear from game players as as much. Wasn't even, oh, yeah, in those days, there wasn't, wasn't an the internet. internet. You couldn't do over the no, air. it wasn't even updates. the internet. So, hey, I like yeah, that, that game. Do, and you couldn't do the updates, um, you know, over the air and downloading them. And 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 so we, we're learning now that, in a sense, 
we say, oh, well, yeah, we're done with Colossal Cave, but but are we really? I was just on the phone with a marketing guy that's working with us um, on ads and, you know, things like that and reviews. And, and he's, he was saying, well, you know, you need to do this now and you need to do that now because this is what they're saying and this is what they want. And, you know, so it, that's different. It really is different. Yeah, a lot of points of the book, you know, Ken was saying, well, if we if we, we wanted to, uh, we would like just to continue to keep developing this. And, you know, I guess you would have liked to have some kind of system to keep doing these steady updates, mm -hmm. and, you know. Maybe. Yeah, well, <laughs> you know, we told, the well, is, is it ever over? You know, you want to move know, on. No, I'd like it to be over. Then we could do something else. <laughs> the internet just started when we sold the company. Yeah. We um, barely starting. In fact, we we never actually had um, email. I think we had email that was on the local area network. There was never anything that kind of would go outside the company. So it was, um, yeah, we sold too soon in a way. I mean, wish we had hung out another couple of years when the internet started up, and it would have been a lot of fun. Sierra shouldn't have ended. That is that is a disappointing thing. So. Nobody's going to argue with, with you on that point yeah. <laughs> here. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we didn't know that it was going to be like that. So I thought it was uh, the beginning, not the end. So, oh, well. Yeah, this is um, probably some of the darkest chapters in there were around that whole C. Is it C-U-C or do you, is that how it's pronounced? C -C. Yeah, C-U-C is how we called it. Um yeah, and then Sierra, after we sold it, went to a company called Viendi, Vivendi, who sold it to Activision, and now it's part of Microsoft. So it's yeah, um, yeah, moved I don't, around. I don't know what Microsoft's going to do with it. Maybe nothing. You know, maybe something. Yeah, we're optimistic. It'll be, it'd be mm -hmm. interesting. I'd like to see them. I know the people at Microsoft uh, like the old Sierra products, and... Um, I think it's just a matter of somebody having a good vision for what to do with any of the old Sierra games, and they could come back to life, and hopefully well. So they, they're the ones that have the, I guess, all the IP now? They've got all the IP. They've got everything. Or most of it. I yeah, I, I think I heard that Leisure Suit Larry got sold off to, um, really? a, company, yeah, to a company called Codemasters out of oh, the UK. Yeah. Oh. Well, and then Half-Life, obviously, well, um, it went to Valve. So, and some of the bigger games, like we had NASCAR and um, that, I don't know who's publishing NASCAR these days, if anybody. And uh, Hoyle's Card Games was another one that was big for us. And, and I, I don't think that exists anymore. Although that one, I think anybody could probably do that. Yeah. But well, I mean, you got to have a Hoyle's license. Yeah. I, I, there was, we had a lot of good licenses. I mean... Disney products, we had Ultima, we had, I mean, we had a lot of Half-Life, we had a lot of good games. Yeah, one of my favorites. Oh, that I was, uh, that was one of the best games we ever produced. Yeah. That's a big box of it, either that or softly close to the camera. Yeah. That's I a like that box. That's the game of the year. Yeah, we used to do really good boxes. We did. And there's no boxes today. Oh, that's so, kind that's of a... disappointing. That was also one that was sort of a Hmm. He has no boxes well, anymore. We actually have just worked with uh, limited run games. They're taking advance orders now for Colossal Cave in a box. And um, I think people have to pre-order it or they may not get it. I'm not sure how limited run games works. But mm -hmm. um, our PC version, the uh, limited run games version, is pretty amazing because has a USB stick plus a key for Steam. And we put several hundred dollars worth of uh, books on the USB stick. Oh. We had the space, so we figured let's load it up. So, um, you know, Stephen, I think it's Emons, Emmons, I don't know how he pronounces his name, Emons, his book is there. And Sean Mills' book is there. Roberta's book is there. My book is there. And uh, some other books. So it's... Um, yeah, just to do a plug for the uh, box version of Colossal Cave uh, will be worth checking out. I don't think it's out till July, though. So I'll keep an eye out for that for sure. That'd be great. Yeah, but if you go to the Lemon Run game site, they're taking back orders now. Are and, you going to sign uh, them? Is it like a uh, oh. Now, you know, 
I the coolest one on um what what did we do it on? Maybe it was my book. I don't remember what we did, but we uh we actually put wax seals on oh, yeah. and stamped it and uh, and signed. Yeah, that was a big really was, popular. Yeah, it was but it was a pain in the butt. I had melted melted wax all over our kitchen table and it was uh it was a project getting it done and getting the wax to stick. But, but it was nice. It was, it was nice, nice and that was do. fun. That it was, was nice. That was a do. fun one. Yeah. And one of the themes that comes up here all the time is, you know, this gen my channel is mostly retro gamers and people that like the classics, and but they're always complaining because they they love the the game boxes and the manuals and even the clue books and just yeah. all even the discs. You know, they they yeah. really miss that so much. And I know that was a big part of your, uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you, you put you lavish so much attention on those. Yes. Oh, you know, a retro thing we did that we don't promote is that we did a hint line. Like remember the old 900 hint lines we used to do? Sure. We have one and darned if I remember what the phone number is. That, uh, yeah. Well, I have the phone number uh, on, and Col on Colossal Cave. I did a, I did a um, video uh, right up front I uh, saw it. actually <laughs> in the game. So when you go into the well, well, I don't want to say it's well, the little building, the little brick building, uh, when you go in uh, inside, there's an old TV set and I'm there and I start um, telling about playing the, game, the history of the game that, you know, way back to William Crowther and Don Woods and how and how and what happened to them, what they were into to create Col Colossal Cave back in the early 70s. And then tips and strategies for playing the playing the game. And and in it, I included our hit line with the phone number, <laughs> so it's there. Oh, that's if you, true. Yeah, if you play, if you go and you turn on, you kind of click on the little TV, and I come up, okay. and I mention it, and and the phone number is. And that's that's your personal phone number that pops up. No, <laughs> no, it's it not. was in the early days. <laughs> no, yeah, in the early, early, early days it was, yeah. but no, now it's not. But it's uh, it's there. That's so cool. Are yeah. you getting lots of calls or? Uh, yeah, uh, I, I got to look up. Oh, here it is. It says it's two o or area code two o six two zero seven nine zero one seven. Although I'm going to call it now. No, don't call it. it. <laughs> no, 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 don't. I need call. a hint. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> is really? it two one seven? You know, I called that number that it says it is, and it didn't answer. It might not work. See, and then we're in trouble. Real life quality assurance, right? Yeah, here. it didn't work. So okay, after this call, it. I got to fix we that. We got to fix it. Okay. Now, could that be? <laughs> I think Funny, it, somebody could be stuck on a snake right now. I don't know. You oh, know. no. I, okay, I think it does. Let's work. go back to the. I gave the wrong number. One that. sec. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, but Roberta, you'd, you'd mentioned that uh, that little TV that pops up in the, in the well yes, house. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. You know, I've heard that story about. You know, uh, Crowder and Woods and the, the real life spelunkers and all that. But I had yeah. never heard the part about his, his Patricia. Yes. And like the role that she played in this. And I'm like, that's an important part of the story that I've it never was, and it, it, It's so interesting. Their lives are so are so interesting. Um, back to uh, their spelunking days and how how deep, no, no pun intended, they got into it, into spelunking. Uh, which they apparently really did, really deep. But um, they were also mountain climbers, especially Will Crowther. He was really into mountain climbing, which I think a lot of people don't really know that. And um, and they, but they were part of a team that was looking for this. Uh, there's two big uh, cave systems. One is in Kentucky, I believe, and one kind of goes over into West Virginia, although I could be wrong on that, but they're, they're very close to each other. And uh, one is called Mammoth Caves um, Cave System. And the other one is called the Flint Ridge Cave System. And it was always assumed that they were one in the same, that there was a, a link between them. And, uh, and in the spelunking world, that's kind of a big deal. And so they were part of kind of a, an elite team to try to find that. And they they went there often to the Mammoth Caves in Kentucky and maybe also on the Flint Ridge side to look for it. And they were theorizing where it may be. And they eventually came to a spot 
which they call this the tight spot, which is also in the Colossal Cave game. Uh, and, um, you know, they made sure that was put in. And, um, and, and there was a, a very little, tiny little crevice that they, you know, Patricia, especially Patricia Crowther was Will Crowther's wife. And that she, they thought that it possibly, if they could just get through there, and uh, she was very tiny, and she just said, "I will go. I will go. I will try to get through there." And she had to really shimmy in there, which was actually very dangerous because if she got caught in there, there might be no way to get her out. Uh, literally, um, if you're caught between two, you know, huge stone walls. There's no way I would do that. <laughs> she made it through. She made it through to the other side and uh, and saw there was a whole nother part of cave and it it turned out that it was the Flint Ridge system, which uh, and which I say in in my little mini documentary in uh, in the beginning of Colossal Cave, when you go in the little little house, you'll see that it's only seven minutes long. So it's not like, you know, it you have to be there for an hour watching. But um it was kind of like the uh, climbing to the top of Mount Everest for the first time in the spelunking world. It was a big deal in the spelunking world back then. And that was like 1972. So that's that's sort of their background. Um, and then I go on with the story and people can, you know, I don't want to well, bore everybody now. <laughs> one, of, one of the cool things about the project is that... Um, we were actually able to have Don Woods play the game when we were developing oh. it. And he was incredibly sharp and exactly like you would think he would be as a designer. We have a picture of him. Yeah. With it's, his quest. His quest. Well, no, that was uh, Crowther. We have Crowther. a picture. Oh, yeah. I'm talking about Woods oh, when Don Woods was writing this oh, yeah. during QA. Oh, that's right. Don. Yeah. And then later, uh, Crowther's daughter contacted us. Just a, just a couple of months ago, maybe yeah. a month ago. Sent us a picture of him playing uh, the game in VR. So, <laughs> I mean, what a. Um, I, there was a picture of him sitting in front of his fireplace. With the um, you know the what is it the quest two I think quest two on his head, and you know, he's you know, he's doing this, and it, he's playing the game and and she told us she said his very first thing he said when he put it on because you start the game in the forest, and before you is a little building, mm -hmm. and she, and he said to her, they put the stream on the wrong side. And she said to him, and I said to her, how, how would you know which side is the right side? But he knew because it was his game. Yeah. And I thought that was so funny. Well, <laughs> yeah. And very cool. But, he, have... but the bottom line is she said he was loving it. Yeah. And imagine his career. He, he goes all the way back to before the Internet inventing uh, one of the very first text games up to playing it in VR. And he also, it was part of inventing the internet. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you go further into the story, uh, we, uh, that's explained as well. We were just happy to hear we didn't bomb the story and try to tell the history and that uh, the family confirmed that we got it right. We got it right. It. Yes, that, the history that, of the family, it's a little sad area in it. And she said that um, she she respected and, and loved how I dealt with it um, in a very nice way. And, um, and it was really not, it was really great. Great to hear from them. Really well, well done. I, I played the, the text version and now of course the, you know, the graphical version, but one thing that I thought was neat about the, about the remake or your version, I guess, was, you know, when you go from the, like you, that, that forest starting zone, it's kind of nice and open, <laughs> uh, but then when you open that trap door and you're going inside the cave, I you just feel that difference. Oh yeah, that's really where the graphics. I mean, it makes a huge difference. Yes. Uh, Wait as you're going through it, we tried to take each region and give it a fresh feel, like so that you really feel like you're discovering new territory as you're digging down in the cave. Right. So it. Um, well, but I have to say, um, I I was. Um, I was the art director on this project, um, along with just sort of recreating it. And I was the the so-called expert of the game. I had to I had to know it and understand it intimately. 
um, and um, make sure we tried to get everything in as, as we could. Uh, although with graphics, especially 3D graphics, it, it's not, it's not, wasn't possible to do every single thing exactly the same. And, uh, and I just pretty much say that up front. We, we tried when it's not in your own imagination and text only, uh, you actually are showing what it is. It, it, it does change things a bit, but tried to stay the same, but, uh, where was I going with this? Who knows? <laughs> Who knows? Um, I'll tell you, when you take something from text to 3D or visuals, you know, and we tried to approach it like we were exactly reproducing the game as close as we could, but the original game was probably not more than a thousand lines of code. 700, and, like 750,000, uh, 750, 750 lines, 750 of, lines code. of code. Of yeah, program. our version has got to be 40 or 50,000 lines of code. And I, yeah, and I had to learn Fortran, which actually, as it turns out, is pretty easy. Um, it, once I started looking at it and, and and we poured over those 750 lines of code all the time. Yeah, that was, that was kind of, try to understand we studied it. it. Every decision was based on studying the original. Yeah. But even little things, the final paragraph of the game, if you're playing the text game, it has some text that talks about, and I don't want to spoil the game for anybody, but there's a description of some fireworks and some um, all celebrating for the end of the game. And I was just going to display that in text. And Roberta said, no, you got to do it. And I said, well, but in one paragraph of text, you can do all this incredible stuff. And to actually try to do that in the game, and there's probably a couple of let's not months of effort. Too much. What it's about? What happened? Yeah, I don't want to say too we much about, to but it's uh, it's pretty cool. I mean, the end of the game is worth getting to, and nobody will appreciate how much work went into just that little slice of the game because we wanted to be faithful to the original. Well, the other one that was really tough to do with graphics was um, the breathtaking view. In mm -hmm. the game, there's something called the breathtaking view, and when you get there. It it the the text description is a couple of paragraphs long. It's really long, very uh, you know, lots of adjectives about what you're seeing, you know, and very dramatic and intense. And to try to create a graphic view of that breathtaking view was really hard to try to do that and put in everything that they said was there that you were seeing. It was hard, but, 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 but fun, fun to do. It was fun. I mean, even though we worked, cause we worked crazy. I mean, we worked uh, 12 hours a day for almost two years and I mean, our friends thought we had died or something. I mean, we really kind of fell off the face of the earth while working on the game. And like normally, uh, boating had been a big part of our lives, and we thought we could go out on a boat and develop the game. But the game development is just too intensive. I mean, it really kind of keeps you staring at your screen. Yeah. So, but now that it's done, we got to figure out what we're going to do next. And um, haven't quite figured that one out yet. I played golf today. That was something I couldn't do when we were building the game. So, but I don't know. Well, what else can we tell you? It was kind of, you know, I was thinking it was not that dissimilar, or maybe it is. I don't know. You could tell me. But when somebody, when a movie producer comes along and makes a movie about a novel or a book, you hear a lot of the same. And I was thinking about Woods saying that they, their stream was on that side, you know, so people have this, you know, it's the same sort of principles at work that yeah. people have this, they're imagining what this room looks like. Yeah. Thing, you have to actually, that's the way we thought about it. You have it, to yeah. try to, uh, yeah. You have to try to think about it yourself and imagine. I just kind of, as the as the art director, and I was working with because I'm not an artist, but um, I'm working with them to tell them what I saw in my mind, and also um, as much as I mean, because that's the only thing you can really do is when you're playing the game yourself and you get your your thoughts in there. That maybe my thoughts are the same as other people's thoughts. But you know, not not sure. But um, 
and uh, and to, to try to guide them with how to do the art and how to change it, how to have it be. Make sure that the directions are correct in the in the cave. Uh, if it says you're going north, you're going north. If you're going southeast, you're going southeast, et cetera, et cetera. But um, you know that that I had to impart part that to them and then they did it and then we would work on it just to try to to make sure that we were trying to be as faithful as we could to what we thought mm -hmm. people might want to see we were faithful to a fault with emphasis on fault the um there was a great temptation during development some of the puzzles in the original game were i think even crowther and woods would say illogical and um uh, you know, and we decided, I mean, and any bugs that were in the original game, any logical flaws that were in the original game, we wanted it all. I mean, in a way, we were trying to recreate history. It um, it was more like a, you know, a love letter to the past or whatever you wanted well, to tribute, call it. Tribute to well, here's kind of an interesting thing that I was just dealing with today, talking to the, the marketing person. We have somebody that helps us with uh, social media, you know, and uh, just... Uh, Oh, the, the, the various stores, storefronts for Steam and Epic and whoever else. And, uh, and there's, I guess there's somebody and he may even watch, he may be watching you when you do this. I, I don't remember exactly. It's, it's a, it's a, a fellow who, who has played our game, the Colossal Cave, and apparently a lot of them and it. His name is something Zork. Uh, something Zork is uh, his um, his social media name. And I guess he's going through the game and trying to find all the spots that maybe we missed or we got it wrong, you know, to, to compare it to the original. And um, and just little little changes here. This little tiny- He won't find much. No, but it, one, one thing that was interesting, <laughs> no, he, I don't think he has, but um, but- but there are a few, I mean, I will admit it, um, that just had to be because of being a graphical bit game versus text and, and you know, things like that. But um, this had to do with the the uh, gold nugget. There's there's a gold nugget and uh, that you find. You go, there's, when you first get in the cave, you go down a ways and, you know, and then you come to a staircase, go down the staircase and you're in a place called the, it's a stone staircase in the in the hall of mists and when you're in the hall of mists you can find and i'm this is the beginning of the game so i'm not giving away too much but there's a place you can find a gold nugget and you can pick up the gold nugget it's very big and it's very heavy and if you try to go back up those stone staircase uh it says you can't the 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 gold nugget is too heavy and you can't you'll never get it up the steps so that's your, that's one of your very first puzzles is, oh, now I've got this gold nugget. Now I want to get it up the stairs, but how am I going to do that? It's too heavy. Well, of course you have to keep going through the game and figure this stuff out. Well, apparent, and, and I knew this, you know, as the chief uh, reimaginer, um, I knew that if you had the gold nugget, eventually you might be able to find your way in a circu circuitous way back up to the top of those steps and find yourself at the top. Well, in the original game, and, and that's where there's something called the bird chamber where there's a bird, you know, and so you leave the bird chamber and, and you are at the top of these stone steps to go down. If you leave the bird chamber with the gold nugget in, in your inventory, you will immediately fall over and down over the steps into your death in the original game, the original text game. But we didn't do that. <laughs> if you get the gold nugget at the bottom, you still can't get it up the steps. But if you find your way around the game and you get back to the top of that, those, you leave the, the bird chamber and you go out the door, we just let you go down the steps with your, your, your gold nugget and, Nothing happened. Nothing bad happened. Whoever to you. figured that out? Well, it's true, and I I remember I remember um, knowing that and talking with the programmer, and he, and he argued with me, and I said, but it's part of the original game, but but 
you know, modern players, they don't like to die too much. And we already die a lot. Blah, blah, blah. And so I got, he wore me down. He wore me down. And so I didn't, I didn't push it. I pushed a lot. I have to tell you, I pushed a lot. Uh, but I didn't, I, you know, I, I gave in and, uh, and so this was brought up again because Mr. Zork, Mr. Whatever Zork brought it up and said, that's not the same. You didn't do that. Which made me think I was going to talk to this guy over here. I'm not changing it. And say, should we go back in and make it? That <laughs> We've we got the game on 21 platforms. 21. Any change has to get ripped yeah, for all yeah. 21 and, platforms. And that's the basic thing I said. I said, I, I don't think he's going to want to do that. I'm yet. always the evil money man. But it was my fault. And anybody out there that's listening to this is, says, well, well, that's one place where you didn't stick exactly to the game is, well, yeah, I let the programmer, you know, <laughs> he, he argued very, you know, persuasively and I gave in, but I didn't give in on very much, I, I will say. Yeah, this was the game that inspired you to get into the industry right you'd played you yeah. actually had a perfect score i mean that was that alone is a very impressive achievement <laughs> in my book <laughs> took me a while but yeah i did it i actually, loved it's it a game a, a funny story we were on a uh, panel about, about a year ago with um oh what's his name uh ron uh, gilbert oh, yeah. and he was talking about how he got into the business and he was explaining that he played this game called Adventure that was a text game. When he was in eighth grade. Yeah. And then he looks over at us and he says, is that the game you're remaking? <laughs> right there on the panel. <laughs> on the panel in front he, of everybody. Yeah, he was sitting one was... over from me and he looks at me. Is that the one you're you're doing? Mm -hmm. And I, I said, mm-hmm. <laughs> he went, oops. Oh. No, I, this game was the... Uh, started careers for not just us a lot of people in the business there's others i don't want to name them yeah no i mean I, bobby but kodak i talked bobby to him kodak. at activision yeah. he was saying that it was a game that started his career played and, as, yeah. as a as a young, young person and, well, and then, started his career the guy that ran uh, uh unity what's the name ah uh, richitello or whatever it is he was saying the same thing although yeah. He's kind of on the outs now. No, it doesn't matter. Don't say that. It's oh, not nice. Can't say that. No. I want to bring him up at some point. Never that did. one's not a secret, though. Yeah, but don't. Okay. Um, uh, no. It's it been a lot of people. Pivotal game. It is. I'm pretty it's, sure it's the first game I ever played, but I did it indirectly because my dad, he was working at a plywood plant. And I guess they had a computer because what, what he would do is bring home uh, printouts. Of colossal cave, he, I guess it wasn't a monitor. I don't know what the, I don't remember the details, but uh, he would bring these uh, printouts, and then we would talk <laughs> about what you know might be the solution to the puzzle. So I, I count that as playing the game. Oh wow, <laughs> you would play it from the printouts. Interesting. Then mm -hmm. he would go back and do it, huh? Right. And then give, and then bring more printouts. Yeah, so it took a long time. Yeah. <laughs> I remember those days, a young programmer typing on uh, punch cards and then waiting for printouts to come right. back. Yeah. And it would make it a very slow development cycle because mm -hmm. you put in a bug and you have to wait four hours for printouts to come out to fix your bug. Well, yeah, that must have been quite an experience going from the you know Apple II and the, with the Visi or whatever I forget the name of the little drawing tablet and all this uh, going <laughs> from that uh, to Unity. <laughs> Oh yeah. gosh, yes. Yeah, that was I, the, I, when I first saw yeah. Unity. I, that, I was thinking that, um, and Roberta, even back then, we had a, our own engine at uh, Sierra that mm -hmm. all of the games are based on. And, you know, Roberta at the time was saying, you know, we should have marketed the engine as a product so and I, yeah. uh, kept going. That, um, you know, when I first saw Unity or some of today's tools, I was thinking, this is. This is what we had this at Sierra. This is what we had, and we uh, just gave it away. Yeah. And, uh, well, we didn't give it away. Well, we kept it as a monopoly, we, we, in effect. I mean, that was our competitive advantage was yeah. that we had an engine that allowed us to develop for multiple platforms. We had all the, we had the tools, yeah. Our yeah, own tools. it's hard to imagine now, but in those days, there were no... We um, made a big difference. ...animation editors. There was no paint programs. There was no... Um, um, like Visual Studio, I mean, any kind of, uh, what do you call IDE for developing software? It was a, um, 
you know, if you needed a tool, you had to program it yourself. So we had a uh, tools group at Sierra that built all the underlying tools that the game groups used. And, you know, we had to do all of our own engine development. And it was, uh, it was a and challenge. And keep it updated. And as the technologies, um, you know, increased, we had to change that too and keep updating the tools and tools and keep well, it was Kind of, you know, uh, King's Quest, one of the reasons King's Quest did so well, in addition to just being a really good game, was that each time we'd approach a King's Quest project, well, because we knew there was a lot of demand and it was going to sell well, we have the engine group work on finding something new that nobody had seen before that we could do with it. So people would look to each King's Quest game not just to be a great game, but to uh, show off new technology in some new way. So it was where, you know, we had started adding sound effects or adding sound or adding point and click or adding uh, animation, adding third person. I mean, it was um, it was through King's Quest. If you play that series, you kind of see the see history the progression. of um, the industry. Yeah. So because we always wanted to push the state of the art with each we new we King's generally Quest. yeah we generally use king's quest as the um the vehicle for um for moving forward with um technology or updating uh adding adding new features uh ch even changing um our um you know our our uh, our interface our interface yeah. you know how you how you interface and communicate with the game we change it from a parser to point and click and icons well and that was roberta and, that was and each time we'd that start something me. you know i i'd meet with roberta and say okay how are we going to change the world and she would um yeah she would try to think of something and well i would say you know what always uh, when it was time for a new king's quest and that was about every 2 years i think year and a half 2 hmm. years uh, it's okay. We got, we got to do, and he would tell me it's, you got to do a King's quest. So it'd be a King's quest. And then I would do something else and then a King's quest and something else and then a King's quest and something else. So I actually kind of enjoyed no, no offense to the King's quest players, uh, King's quest, but, uh, but it was always kind of nice to have the thing in the center, you know, a new thing I could do. So I could do uh Laura bow mystery series. I could start that with, Colonel's bequest or do um I don't know whatever else. Uh, oh, there it yeah, is. Yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. Some of the great uh, like water. Or, you what know, or that? or later on towards the end, uh Phantasmagoria was between King's Quest 7 and King's Quest 8. And so there was always something in in between. And um so where was I going with this? So um was it was it something that was exciting oh we're gonna oh i well, well no it was about the uh, it was about the uh the changing from a parser the, how oh. we use king's quest that's what it was how i use king's quest um to to change the technology and ken would say it's time to do another king's quest and i would i would say well what what can you tell me what is the new technology that we're talking about because mm -hmm. he's he's the technology guy i'm not I, you know, I'm not a programmer, really. Um, I'm a creative person. You know, I'm a storyteller. You know, I, I can take the information that that I get and put it together with interfaces and 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 designing a game. And I would say, what are the what are the 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 high tech um, new stuff that we have to work with? What it what's the device? What's the computer? What can it do? versus the last time and he would tell me and uh and as soon as i knew what i had to work with then i would just incorporate it in the design and then the design would uh help move along our tools our adventure game engine and tools so that's how how it worked yeah i think so with the uh, embracing these latest technologies too the I remember reading magazines back in the day, and they would be you know, showing the like the King's Quest as a uh, as how the uh, computer games industry was evolving. Right, like here, look yeah. at how great, here, look how far we've come. You know, this is a good reason. This is why you need to have the latest uh, you know graphics card. You know that sort of thing. So it was right, I right, mean, huge influence. Yeah, 
yeah, because I, I always, my, my main thing is I always wanted to up the graphics. Mm -hmm. um, graphics and animation was real important to me, but also sound effects, later on voices, uh, um, characters, obviously. Um, I, I mean, I, I wanted it all, but it, it all really did kind of go around the graphics. You know, maybe I was thinking at the back of my mind, cartoons or or animated movies that you or Disney actually um, to be try to be more and more and more like that. And how could I get that? And that's what we concentrated on, at least for my my stuff. Well, you my also game. did live actions with Phantasmagoria. Yeah. Phantasmagoria. yeah that, was, that was a huge breakthrough was, at the time. Yeah. That was our first million copy seller. So I must have now, in today's fun. world, that doesn't sound like I a know lot. I've made it in it today's then. world is it was then. <laughs> it was a big deal in those days. <laughs> yeah. You know, in the book you had said that you speculated about that a phantasmagoria and what would it be like that game be like today, you know, using I guess Unity or you know, some some modern engine and maybe you could even find the original footage somewhere. Oh god, I wish you know, I is, this, is this a project that's somewhere in the back oh. of your mind? I wish they had saved it. Um Sierra when it died. I mean, I've got the original. I've got a box with all the original. No, but CDs. nobody has the original video footage, although video capture. You know, I thought for the longest time, speaking of Phantasmagoria, that I I I wrote the script for it. And it was in a notebook that thick big notebook the whole, and it was oh it was 550 something pages script and i and i used the word script uh I, I i never had done designed an adventure game as a script before but i did for this one uh because the story is more linear uh just because of the way it goes as a almost a movie like um Mm -hmm. you know uh ga game is in it the the story the story line is is much more developed and linear although obviously when you play it you can do lots of exploration on your own and they're still solving things but but um the the script was very big and i thought it was lost for the last 25 years i didn't know where it was I, and I kept thinking, somebody must have it somewhere. If only I could find it, I would love to have it. I found it recently <laughs> and I had it all along. Ah. Uh, we moved, we moved from a, a place we, we've lived in for a lot, very long time, moved to a new place. And, and there was a, there was this box of stuff that I don't remember having seen before for a long time, apparently. And I opened it and there it was. And I went, oh my God, here it the, it's here. And I was just I, like so thrilled because the whole thing is there, including all the comments that I was writing in it and everything. And and I thought, wow, this is like a treasure. Um, so I have the script, I have the, the whole script, everything. So we could do it. But, but we don't own it. The problem is we don't we don't we don't own it anymore. We can't. Microsoft has it. They're Microsoft. Just, just up the road. <laughs> Microsoft, why don't you do it? I know people. <laughs> <laughs> I think I had a question uh, about Phantasmagoria. So they were wondering, was it your intention to continue the series with Adrian as the main character? No, no, my intention um, was not. My intention was to um, have it be kind of like a horror series, but every one would be different. Uh, and I wanted to do the second one, but as it, that was, I finished Phantasmagoria and, and uh, King's Quest Seven was, was going on at the same time. So I was more focused on Phantasmagoria at the time. I a little less on King's Quest Seven, and I had a, a co-designer named Lorelai Shannon. You may know, uh, I've heard of Lorelai. She was. Uh, I worked with her on developing the the design for King's Quest Seven. So I was there. I was there for the design, and uh, I was very involved in it. But but um, 
then she took the design and she more or less handled it and managed the art and, you know, and putting it together. And then, and then I would come in every now and then to see how it was doing. And then I, I play tested it and QA it at the end, just like I do with all my games, but I wasn't as involved with this King's quest as, as my, as the others because of Phantasmagoria. And, um, so, uh, but then Lorelai did. But the, Fantastic. Oh, but then too. Laure, yeah, but then Lorelai, so what she did, she she skipped from King's Quest 7 to doing Phantasmagoria 2 because I had just finished Phantasmagoria 1 and was now on to King's Quest 8. So it, it, we sort of skipped each other, but and I was actually a little bit upset with him a little bit because I really wanted to do the, the next phantasmagoria but he was just really really he wanted to get right back in and do another phantasmagoria because it was doing so well that um and i had to do king's west eight and it was right then and when we were selling the company you know and that's part of what you said was kind of sad at the end hmm. uh, you know kind of selling the company and then you know doing really well and and suddenly there were these mix-ups with Phantasmagoria and then King's Quest Eight, and we got caught in the whole melee. And it's just, you know, it was just, it was kind of a sad time. It was a sad time for me, actually. But, but that was it. I wanted to, I wanted to have it be, um, each Phantasmagoria be its own story. I just, I did want to do the second one, but they did a great job. Mm -hmm. So, were you but think, it never went on after that. Were the other series going to evolve and from? into full motion video games? Or? I think every game is its own. Every game has to be its own thing. Yeah, uh, I mean, Leisure Suit Larry would make no sense. Uh, uh -uh. That would be, well, I, although I, um, there's no, a few I TV think... shows that effectively were Leisure Suit Larry so. being made as live action. And I don't see, I don't see King's Quest, King's Quest yeah, as, live as live action. It, it just, it all depends. Space Quest, um, it's beautiful as animated. Uh, the guys that are doing uh, Space Venture, which was intended to be the next Space Quest, in effect, and it looks great as cartoon type graphics. It, it'd be wrong to ever do yeah. that. As yeah, although there was a movie Spaceballs that we thought was based on Space Quest it, that was yes, live action. Space Quest could be with actors. Yeah. Um, it that one could be. I don't think so much Leisure Suit Larry. The reason why Phantasmagoria was done with actors is because the subject matter of horror, in my opinion, requires actors because you have to be, you have to feel empathetic empathy for the the human beings that you see, um, cartoon characters, even really really well done cartoon characters, uh, uh, you know, like. Uh, uh, Pixar, you could maybe do really well done ones. Maybe with AI now, maybe you, you could uh, do it with computer characters if it was done that way. But I'm not so sure because to really create horror and 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 people do say that Phantasmagoria was scary, mm. it scared them, and you know like that, and and felt empathy towards. Adrian, the main character, because she was a real human being at, and as an actress, and she reacted and her her you know her facial expressions and her tone of her voice and everything that was happening around her made you feel for her and when and you cared about her. And when you care about her, you're going to care about what happens to her. And and that's one of the things that helps you create horror. I, I don't really think you can create real horror where you're scared mm -hmm. uh, and you unless it's human beings. That's that's my opinion. Mm -hmm. And that's why we did that. So it wasn't like I want we wanted to get into movies. It was for that reason. I think you said that it's something similar to that about romance or romantic games. Do they also benefit from? Uh, live actors versus a yeah mm -hmm. i think that would be true because you got you have to have emotion or subtle uh, things about a, the face facial movements and eye mm -hmm. movements yeah you you have to have and anything that's going to 
try to get a, a big emotion out of you, as, whether it's a movie or whether it's a game, especially if it's story-based, that brings out the emotion in you. And, and I would think maybe even a, a, with about animals, you know, say your dog or something. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think you could have a sort of a cartoony dog and feel emotions about it unless it was a real dog. Hmm. That, you know, I, I mean, these are the thoughts you think when you're in my position of trying to come up with a new game or story idea, how to show it, you know, how to showcase it. How to tell that story. That's really fascinating. I have a sort of a more general question than that, you know, just about games. And one of the things I got from reading the book was there was this tension uh, between the creative side or creative types <laughs> uh, versus the business side of the industry and business decisions. And, you know, I realized that there's uh, there's that same tension in every creative field, music, movies, but I was just, is there anything unique about the game when it comes to making games? Is there a different kind of clash between creative types and, you know, the more business side or is it just one in the same? No, I think it's one and the same. It's um, yeah, the the business people always want to make money and are trying to. Uh, you, you know, it's tough with artists or perfectionists. In fact, uh, you know, most of the creative people on a project are perfectionists, and I've seen artists that'll spend days working on a particular animated character or weeks and. Um, Whereas from a business perspective, you know, you're you're more thinking, I've got this much animation in the game. I've got this big of a budget for animation. I could spend this much per frame of animation. And, uh, you know, people are either kind of analytic or creative. And it's kind of rare to find both in the same box. And, um, yeah, you kind of need both. And I'm sure the film business, uh, to the extent I've been around it, is kind of exactly the same. I mean, the um, yeah, there's always somebody that's got to be tugging on the purse strings and saying, you know, I'm only going to spend five million on this movie or ten million on this movie, and try to rein in the spending. And um, yeah, so I, I always had to feel like the bad guy on the projects. And um, and he hates being the bad guy. He yeah, really I hate hates being it. the bad guy. But, and um, then when he feels bad about being the bad guy, then he comes on to me, you know, like, you're you're taking too long and getting this done. And, yeah, you know. no. Even on so, this Colossal Cave project, I mean, toward yeah. the end, I was kind of like, come on, guys, we got to finish this game now. And they'd say, no, we got, we got to do this. We got to do that. Or like you just heard when Roberta was saying it, she wanted to go back in and change the puzzle. And I'm thinking, I well, got I didn't 21 say I wanted versions to. of the game. I didn't say I wanted to. It was more, this is a discussion I was having today with someone oh. that I hadn't heard this. And I knew about it, but I had forgotten. It's been a while since I've worked on this design when we were in the development phase. And I had forgotten about it. And, oh, yeah, that that is interesting. Because then I started thinking, you know, then my, my, you know, the little wheels go. And I was thinking about the gold nugget and and the fact that if you, got it to the top of the steps and you you go down the steps with it in the original game it would kill you if you tried to do that but we made we let you do it and i thought well, actually you know what have been really cool if we had done it and i hadn't let the programmer talk me out of it is you come out of the top of the steps and if you take one step forward you're going to die but as long as you're standing there you could drop it and then because of the 3D graphics and the physicality of 3D graphics, we could watch the gold nugget roll down the steps or roll down and sort of fall over the edge and go oh. down at the bottom of the pit. And then you could go down the steps and find it down there. I thought that would have been fun to do. And then we, we, did, a lot but we, did, we did a lot of stuff like that, but it, it just, that's another thing. Yeah, and one I of the funnest that. things, if you play the game, just start piling all the inventory objects on top of each other. You can uh, create stacks and play games. It's so I just think that, you know, I just, those are the thoughts. And I think, well, we should have done that. 
Well, this probably explains why your games are so good that you put, you know, so much thought into every aspect and yeah, try. somebody writes We're in really with doing. some feedback and you you really care about it. I do uh, care a lot. Yes. Yeah. I don't know if we could say that about every. <laughs> oh, I think developer. I think everybody cares. They do. They do. Believe me, worked with a lot of game developers and animators and artists and programmers, and, and they do. They care a lot. They do. Okay, well, I got a, one other thing about Phantasmagoria here. Uh, it was in the context of it being controversial and the, of the M rating mm -hmm. that you gave the game. And there was some interesting commentary there, I thought, uh, from Ken. I think I'm just going to quote this part. You're talking about how you think kids should stay kids as long as possible. I think a lot of people would probably agree with this. Uh, but then you talked about how it's kind of a shame uh, that the internet has become kind of a cesspool in a lot of ways, you know, giving people access to the things. And um, so there's like this, uh, on the other hand, you know, controversy is good, <laughs> you know, and it sells games. Uh -huh. So I'm kind of like trying to work through these, you know, it seems like there's a couple of themes there. Well, controversy is good for adults. I mean, you know, with Phantasmagoria, we kind of shot the first uh, nude scene for a game. Oh, partially nude. Partially Not nude. very much. Yeah, it didn't make it's the a, final cut. A but little bit. It was, well, I'm with Leisure Suit Larry, and um, yeah, uh, we we definitely liked controversy. But we did say on the outside of boxes and in our ads, it's for mature. Yeah. In, in those days, parents could control what their kids played and saw a little bit especially if it said so on the box and everything yeah. no we're not buying that game for you you know or no you can't play that but today it's not so easy for parents no as back then so there is a there is a difference well and our games were not all that r-rated no. i mean even no. leisure suit larry would be um a PG-13 at best in today's world. Yeah. And No, I, I laughed out loud. There was a part where you're, I forget the context, but there were people that were talking about the controversial elements and somebody, or I guess they were offended by Leisure Suit Larry and they were, he even said that they were offended by King's Quest. Oh yeah. <laughs> I I believe, come on, what is offensive about uh, I We got letters, uh, uh, you know, that where people would write in and say, King's Quest has to be banned and it's just, it's evil. And I would read the letters and I go, evil? How is it evil? I think it had to do with the fact that I would put occasionally like a witch in there, you know, or a wizard <laughs> and, and what somehow maybe some people thought of it as a devil or a demon or I don't know something and took maybe religious connotations, which I, I never thought of and never thought of. I mean, you know, if you read like the Wizard of Oz and which Wicked Witch of the West and the East and all that, you know, and it's like, yeah, never thought of it in mm -hmm. those terms, but there are pe those people. I, d I did the little uh, question and answer game at the start of Leisure Suit Larry in order to test people's age before we had let them play. And um, it didn't occur to us in those days that a lot of those questions, nobody would know the answer to 30 years later. If you play the old Leisure Suit Larry one, it's asking questions that nobody today would know how to answer. There's political questions um, and all kinds of crazy stuff in there. I was trying to answer the questions for it recently, and I couldn't do it. Political questions. Yeah, like you, um, you uh, there was some the senator who got caught on a boat named Monkey Business. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that question was there, like, what is the name of the guy's boat? And what was his girlfriend's name? The Monkey uh, Business. Yeah, I remember the name of the boat. I don't remember the name of the senator. Yeah, what but, was his uh, name? Hmm. That, uh, yeah, but it was good. It was good because we the, the goal really was to screen out kids. It, it, didn't, really it didn't work, Ken. I, I still play it. <laughs> <laughs> the kids figured it out. Yeah, we figured and, it out. Um, <laughs> yeah. But that was a good game. Leisure Suit Larry was always funny. I I, I, I enjoyed that game a lot. So that was his, he liked playing. I like Leisure Suit Larry. Ken didn't really play King's Quest. He's not a King's Quest player. Huh. Well, I'm not an any adventure game player. They're hard. I, um, no, they require patience. Yeah, I don't have patience. He doesn't have patience. Well, there's a hotline you could call. 
<laughs> well, I thought the point was was spot on about the la- leisure suit Larry. You know, maybe if somebody hasn't played it, they might have the wrong idea. But it's really Larry is the the butt of all the jokes. I mean, yeah, that's not... right. That's yeah. right. No, it was reflective of Valo's personality. He's not sexist at all. No. He's, uh, no. If anything, he's uh, he's uh, he under, him and Margaret. Margaret Margaret's the boss in that family. He's he's not. He's a good guy. He's a good guy. Yeah. Wow. Do you have a time for a few questions from? Uh... Uh, people have sent in. Sure. Okay. Well, I know we do have. We have another people. interview in twenty minutes. Yeah, we've got about ten minutes. Oh, we got maybe a couple. Can okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so this is one about fairy tales, which we were just talking about. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, so several of your game series are influenced by fairy tales. Was there a particular fairy tale you enjoyed as a kid that was especially rewarding to put as a character or a puzzle in a King's Quest or mixed up Mother Goose game? Oh gosh, there's so many. <laughs> I think between the all all eight of the King's Quests, there uh, I I must have dredged up every kind of myth, legend, or fairy tale that you can find, you know, to to put in them. But a favorite, um, probably just the early. You know, I think as a young girl, I I discovered fairy tales when I was in second grade, and. Um, and I at the library and in those days you ha- we didn't have the Internet, of course. And so if you wanted to read a bunch of books, you would go to the library. And, and I think my mother probably took me to the library about every week or two weeks. And I would come out with just a pile of however many they would let me, you know, in the library take out. And almost all of them were the fairy tales you know, th- second grade, third grade, fourth grade, I think fifth grade, I started branching out a little bit from fairy tales. But um, the early King's Quest had like Little Red Riding Hood. And oh, I, I don't I never I never did do like beauty, uh, Sleeping Beauty, um, or uh, Snow White. I didn't do those. I don't think no, I don't think I did. <laughs> um, they got seven dwarfs in uh, Colossal Cave actually we have six dwarfs well we were supposed to have seven and that was will crowther's that wasn't mine oh well, anyway uh let's see but uh i think there you know just the early you know the the, the grim grim fairy grim's tales fairy tales. grim's fairy the tales movie. probably in that in that genre of fairy tales and there used to be like the little red book of fairy tales and the little little blue book of fairy tales and it was all those old probably from the medieval days or you know maybe up to the renaissance days of of europe or or england and in there was and probably that's what really started me on the idea of putting fairy tales in i'd always had a i guess i was probably like most kids more familiar with sort of the disney versions of the fairy tales and i remember oh, reading it was like hansel fairy and gretel grant hansel and gretel and um some of those um, yeah i was surprised at how sort of violent they are they're they are stories i mean these are scary well, and even this even a lot of the nursery rhymes yeah. are uh as i think as ring around I'm trying to remember now. Ring around the rosy, pocket full of posy, tissue, tissue. We all we all fall down. I found out later, you know, that was like a children's thing. You know, they would, I guess, back in I don't know if it was back in the Middle Ages or what, but the kids would hold hands and they go around in a circle, and they would go, you know, ring around rosy, a pocket full of posy, tissue, tissue. We all fall down, and then they'd fall down. Um. It, I guess it was a thing, but it, I learned later that that was uh, about um, like the Black Death or the the plague the plague that they that they had back in the uh, Middle Ages. Some of those plagues and the Black Death, yeah. uh, when they would just see a lot of death around them and people just dying, and that's what it was about. And and some of these others, you when you really find the the real truth of them, you kind of go, oh wow. Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water and Jack fell down and broke his crown. I mean, he broke his head and Jill came tumbling after. (laughs) (laughs) 
<laughs> I just remember the little like, mermaid. Just... I mean, when I was a kid, I just, you know, you hear them and they, and you have your nursery books. And my mom used to read to me the nursery books and I didn't think anything of them. And so I did mixed up Mother Goose. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't even know. I'd like to know, do kids today know these old fairy, or not fairy tales, but um, nursery rhymes? No, that's a good I'm question. not sure. I, I you know, I I, I read them to my kids, but I don't know. Why should I feel? It's kind of sad to think if they don't, yeah. <laughs> you know, sort of. It's like these really ancient stories that are kind of definitive of who we are. <laughs> we shouldn't, yeah, we shouldn't just necessarily let some of this stuff go. I agree. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Eobet. I'm interested in hearing what they thought of the or what they think of the gaming industry today and if they have had time to reflect on their latest game release experience and if they're going back to sailing or making another game. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we're curious. We'd love to know if we're going to go back to sailing or make another game that um, no decision made. And who knows? I mean, we're still young. We got plenty of time. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll do more stuff. But uh, we have a lot of a lot in us. Yeah. Yeah, as far as the industry today versus then, I mean, the biggest difference is um, the amount of competition. I mean, there's more games released every month now, probably, than were even made in our in Sierra's entire history. I mean, it's a, um, I don't know what I've heard, like 300 games a day or something that hit Steam. 300 so games a day? That's yeah, I mean. it's insane numbers, oh. and oh. most do nothing. Most do nothing. They, but, they come um, online and... Are those even real games, you think? There's... Well, a lot of it is... Little things. You know, cute little action games, and it, it's, it's you know, highly competitive. And like the film business or music business or, I mean, you know, how many songs are made every songs day? Songs or how many little indie um, films... Yeah. yeah. Um, so many, but we, with most not. of the dollars going to the big ones and the number of dollars it takes to um I mean there are there are small indie games that do break through and do big numbers. I mean there it does happen, and probably every year there's one or two that do it, but in general, it's the big budget productions that from the big studios are gonna make most of the money for the industry. Mm -hmm. And um you know, even with Roberta's and I's name and with putting a significant amount of money into and, and our Cave, experience and our experience, it's, um, yeah, we'll be okay with this game. It was, hard uh, for us. It was tough for us. It's not just our names and our, our um, background and our experience and notoriety and everything, but it's also the game itself. Colossal Cave it has been around a long time. I mean, people know of it, of, of it, not necessarily modern gamers, but been around uh oh, sure. many 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 I, I don't know maybe millions have played it over however many years 40 yeah. years or so and even with it in 21 formats and, and even still... for us it's been difficult to yeah. get it out there and for people to see it and and uh, play it you know granted it's not it's a it's different than yeah it's it's kind of a vertical niche product but in general, it's just a tough market out there with a lot of competition and um, a virtually no barrier to entry compared to, um, you know, in our days where, you know, CR wouldn't have been competitive, except we had an engine we had been developing for 20 years and we had, um, you know, millions of fans. So anything we did immediately got lots of attention. Well, we had distribution. Yeah, and we had also. distribution worldwide. Yeah. and. Today, everybody has distribution. Everybody has distribution Because you today. just put your game on Steam. Yeah, you just put or, it on there. And there it is. And so, yeah. And and it, everybody has an engine. You just use Unity or Unreal, and yeah. you don't have to write a check. Yeah. And everybody has graphics because the Unity Asset Store is there, and you can pick up a lot of graphics. So it's just... Um, I mean, you know, I guess it's no different than the film industry and in that you can shoot a movie on an iPhone these days and get pretty darn good quality. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, just creative business. And, and you know, any kid with a guitar can make a but song. I, I don't think there's anything so. wrong with that. It, it does make it harder for, for people like us to, or any developer, really, 
Um, and if you're Activision or Microsoft, you got millions and millions of dollars or even a billion dollars if you want to put it in a game. Um, although, you know, even in with the movies, uh, you can you've seen some movies where they've had multi, 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 you know, 300 million dollars to make this movie and then it bombs. So the amount of money isn't always. Yeah, it's not necessarily not a guarantee. It's going to be a great game and it's going to do well. That, it, But I'd still rather have a lot of money to build a game. And was it the Black Cauldron, I think, that bombed and. Yeah, and the also game was, the game was oh, great. No, I was it. Uh, what's was the Disney. other one that we did with Dark Henson? Crystal. Dark Crystal. Oh, where, Dark Crystal. Yeah, the joke at the time was, uh, and it was kind of true that our game outgrossed the movie. Yeah, our our game actually did better than the movie. But, I feel sorry for for saying that. You know, poor Jim, Jim Henson. Uh, well, he did. Yeah. Although Dark Crystal, I think, kind of made a comeback. Did uh, there was a show about it not too long. More ago. respected now than it was. Yeah. Now. Yeah, they. I think they were talking about doing another movie. Or, I'm not sure. It was a good world. It was a good heard. world with great it. characters, and and our game turned out really nice. You know, we really do have to. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. We yeah. gotta go. We we could do one more question, if there if you have one. Anything at the end? Oh yeah. Well, okay. Well, how about um, Apple Vision Pro or Quest? Um, oh, that's too long. You know, I, I just watched Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg being yeah. interviewed comparing the two, and uh, to no great surprise, he thought the Quest 3 was better than the uh, Vision Pro. Um, having spent time good. with the Vision Pro, it's an impressive piece of hardware, but it really is kind of first generation. I mean, it's um, it's it's nice, but it's clearly buggy in some areas, and there's not a lot of stuff on it yet. So we'll have to see where it goes. I mean, for thirty five hundred bucks, it's a, it um, yeah, you know, it's more of a product for people like me, developers who want to develop it. cool stuff and be ready for the future. See what we come up with. I, I have just real quick. I have a thought on this um, yeah. too. Uh, yeah, because I've I spent a lot of time thinking about and and working with the team on putting uh, uh, Colossal Cave onto the Quest Two um, and Quest Three. And PSVR two, PSVR and PSVR two, and PSVR. Yeah, right. you know, yeah. I put all those on my face, and and spending a lot of time, you know, with the artists and the animators and QAing it, and you know, and and all that. And I have opinions about my, uh, you know, how how it feels to me in playing it. And then I've I've spent quite a bit of time on the Vision Pro too. And my personal uh, opinion right now, but it could change with what's going on with Vision Pro going forward but right now i feel that with our game uh that colossal cave is much more immersive with the quest 2 quest 3 psvr 2, two. Yeah, all, those <laughs> all, all those i don't even know he just hands me the headsets and put this on and just play it and qa it you know and give us the bugs uh and um anyway it's it's more immersive because it's all around you you know, you turn your head and it's there and it's there and it's there and it's everywhere. Mm -hmm. And it's way more immersive. Now, the bad part about that is that it can make you sick, you know, analogous to seasickness, a little nauseated, you know, and dizzy and things like that. I And it did me too. But I learned as you play them, because I had to, I, I mean, I had to, I, I spent a lot of time QAing you know, hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and hours because you had to, had to do that, get these games out and get them as bug free and you get used to it. You know, I found that I, I was getting used to it. And I wasn't getting sick anymore, but the bad part is they're big and heavy. And, and so they would start hurting my face. So right here in the bridge of my nose and here on my cheekbones, I started feeling the heaviness and digging into my face and, and I could only go maybe an hour and a half, two hours at the most, I'd get it off. Hmm. Not because it was making me sick anymore. It wasn't, it was the heaviness. So I think that, and I, and, but, but you don't get the same immersive feel in that way with the vision pro because it, 
it doesn't surround they do a lot with pass through mode yeah it, it. it doesn't surround That's you good. you don't feel like you're in it as mm -hmm. much that may change i i saw a picture i don't know if it's in my book of me from almost 30 years ago wearing a vr headset that looks not very different from uh today's vr headsets and uh, the quote was uh, that I said was that I didn't think they were quite ready for prime time yet. <laughs> and and even now, I, you know, when I'm wearing the Vision Pro or something, first thing I say is, yeah, you know, I'm not sure that these are ready for prime time yet. We're a lot closer, but um, I think that I yeah. think that they what for me, I like the more immersiveness of it. Just surrounds you. You're just in it, uh, and I like that. Because you can, if you do it enough, and and it doesn't take that much, you can you can get past the sick part. You your body adjusts, it adapts, your brain does, but it needs to be made smaller and lighter and more delicate, so it can last longer without hurting your face. I mean, for me, that's 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 my thoughts on it. Yeah, I think I mean, had regular eyeglasses that were super heavy, and I know I know what you mean. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, even heavier. Right. And I think they will. I mean, I I think they will. They realize that, but they're just trying to do so much, mm. and, you know, cameras and and sound and it's um and and um just the, well the computer input and outputs and all all of this. It, it's, it's a cool vision of the future. It, it's just it's... so much they're trying to do, and it has to be miniaturized more and yeah. more and more and more. It's all almost it's almost kind of heavy. We're, we're getting there anyway we do have to go yeah we, we got one really again we gotta thank do you. but thank you thank much you appreciated. For thank you yeah, yeah. yep get lots of people to be thinking retro because there was some cool stuff retro's so, good yeah yes but, i agree anyway. okay well thank you, thank you. see ya That's all for this week's episode. <laughs> I hope you guys enjoyed that. Man, it has been a long time. Uh, you know, we're coming up here on the 20th anniversary of Matt Chat, 20 years. And pretty much from the first day, I wanted to get Ken and Roberta Williams on the show because they're some of my favorite uh, designers, favorite companies. I mean, they did published and developed uh, so many of the great games. <laughs> so uh, what a treat to finally get to talk to them. Uh, and get to talk about Colossal Cave, which has such a historically uh, important game, so uh, significant to video games history. It's still a pretty fun game, if you ask me. Uh, but none of this would be possible. We would not have <laughs> two years of Match Hat, much less 20, if it weren't for people just like you, uh, watching the show, liking it, making a comment, <laughs> sharing it with friends, and uh, most importantly, supporting it financially on the Patreon site. So if you are already a member, thank you, thank you, thank you for supporting the show. Keeping humble old Matt Barton making these videos. Who would have thunk it? Well, that person would be you. Uh, so thank you. Uh, if for whatever reason you're still wondering if this is right for me, <laughs> do, do I, how do I do this Patreon thing? I don't know what, what's going through your mind if you haven't already signed up, but uh, just take a minute, click on the link, bada boom, bada bing, a couple of bucks. You're never going to miss it, uh, but it'll make a big difference here at the Matt Chat headquarters. Uh, <laughs> um, the other Matt, uh, Matt Bradley Shergy, and I would uh, really appreciate it if you'd go ahead and set that up. And it's really easy, and I think you'll like the Discord channel as well. Uh, so thank you once again. Okay, what about that news from the Matt Cave? <laughs> <laughs> you know, one problem with doing this show uh, more than uh, once a month is the news can be kind of, it can be kind of hard to find three really good news stories uh, every week. You know, there's just not, <laughs> sometimes you got quiet weeks. <laughs> uh, fortunately, that was not the case uh, this week. Uh, so quite a few things uh, I was able to locate, source. Uh, this is uh, Lawrence Scott over at PC Games In. I was talking about Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition, uh, a new update. So, wow, yeah, 20 years. Uh, is this true? <laughs> uh, so, Neverwinter Nights Enhanced Edition was, or I guess the first Neverwinter Nights was 20 years ago, and Mad Chat's about 20 years ago. 
Hmm, coincidence? Yeah, something to think about. Uh, anyway, this uh, expansion has HDR Bloom oh, post processing effects. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. HDR Bloom? Uh, okay, uh, whatever. Uh, improvements to the gameplay UI. Now oh, that's huge. Hundreds of bug fixes. Wow, hundreds of bug fixes. 20 years of patching and they're still finding hundreds of things. Wow, significant performance improvements and more. Uh, so this really seems like a big deal. Uh, so if you're playing Neverwinter Nights, or maybe you've, you've been holding off on buying Neverwinter Nights until they patch everything up. <laughs> 20 years later, maybe they've got all the major bugs fixed. I don't know. Uh, but anyway, definitely check this out. looks fun. You know, it's a, it's a sign too, isn't it, of how great Neverwinter Nights is? Uh, that there are folks out there still supporting the game and, and, and then this, this community and all this modding activity. I mean, wow. I wonder if they thought when this game was released that people would still be playing it all these years later. Uh, okay, moving on to Tech Radar. Uh, they're talking about a game called The Thaumaturge. What a word. Thaumaturge. <laughs> yeah, I left a big thaumaturge. <laughs> well, never mind. I won't, I won't go there. <laughs> We'll keep the humor friendly, family friendly here on this show. Uh, anyway, The Thaumaturge is a story driven RPG set in 20th century Warsaw. Yes, Poland. Told from an isometric perspective, uh, the game involves turn based combat, investigation, and mysterious supernatural forces. Okay. Uh, the main character, Viktor Zluski, channels salutors. Uh, salutors? Saluters, salutors, uh, powerful supernatural spirits that can help with exploration and combat. Uh, so they were talking about this in the context of the release date being pushed back. I'm not sure what the original date was, but now it's uh, planned for March 4th, uh, 2024. Uh, but this is really the first time I've looked into this game. And, you know, I was looking at the screenshots and some of the descriptions of it, and I, I think it should be on our radar. You know, I, I'm going to keep my eye on this one, but it looks like it might be something special. Uh, well, of course, we'll have to wait and see, uh, but it caught my eye. Uh, and then finally, uh, I've been telling you off and on about this uh, Dragons of Eternity, or I'm sorry, the Dragonlance Destinies series, Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, two of my favorite authors, period, uh, but especially good if you like fantasy novels. Uh, it's even better if you like Dungeons and Dragons because they are truly the masters of that genre. Uh, that I read their uh, Chronicles and the Legends trilogies uh, when I was a kid, and, and I just loved it so much. It's one of the things that got me into this whole business. <laughs> you know, all these years later, if I hadn't read those books, who knows? You know, you read Tolkien, of course, you know, that's great stuff, but um, the Weiss and Hickman, uh, to me, kind of uh, I don't know how to, I don't want to say it's better than Tolkien. I mean, that would be, <laughs> you know, lightning would strike if I said something like that. But uh, it's a different kind of experience, but, you know, really, really fun. And it gives you lots of uh, uh, inspiration for if you want to do, uh, play D&D. But, but anyway, uh, so they've got a new book called Dragons of Eternity. It's the third and final volume of this uh, Destiny series that they have been working on. And it will be arriving in stores, they say, on August 6th. 2024. So just in time for my birthday. So I think I will definitely treat myself to the third uh, volume of this. You know, the other two were just so good. I was amazed at how you know, I kind of dreaded them. <laughs> like like I, I thought, surely this is going to be another one of those big disappointments. You know, one of these things you loved as a kid, but they update it for the modern audience and you read it and you're like, oh my God, I don't even recognize this. And, you know, that wasn't the case at all. You know, I was very surprised how, how much I enjoyed this. Uh, so anyway, definitely go check that out. And I think that will do it for the news. Uh, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, you know, I was looking, I've been, uh, as you know, checking out all these non-alcoholic uh, beers that are out there now. Uh, the little local uh, grocery store slash uh, liquor store, whatever you want to call it, uh, they don't have the biggest selection. Uh, so I might have to find another uh, another store. There's a bigger one in town I might go to to see. Because uh, I know there's this, from what I have understood, <laughs> this is a really exploding uh, industry now of, of non-alcoholics. But uh, anyway, they had a few that I hadn't tried before. Uh, and this one is from Sierra Nevada, who they do a fabulous pale ale. I believe they're based in California. <laughs> Never had a bad Sierra Nevada. You know, a lot of beer making is about the water. 
you know, if you're up in the mountains or someplace where you can get really pure water, uh, chances are you'll have a pretty good beer. And so I think that's probably the reason they're so famous. But this is a non-alcoholic IPA. At least that's what they say here on the can. Uh, contains less than 0.5% uh, alcohol. Uh, Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, uh, Chico, California, and Mills River, North Carolina. So I always like to see if they tell you what kind of hops they use. Uh, let's see, I'm not seeing anything. Uh, not just says balanced and hoppy. <laughs> okay, uh, well, let's get it open and see if it's uh, as hoppy as they claim. You know, especially with a non-alcoholic uh, beer, I really feel like you need to pack in a big punch of flavor. Uh, otherwise, you know, it just seems kind of watery. Okay, so very light color on this one. Very light color. Of course, I'm here in the glass so you can see. A lot of fizz and bubbles, though. Yeah, lots of little bitty bubbles. That's a good sign. Looks very active. You know, if there's one thing I hate, it's a flat beer. And I know some people say, well, <laughs> you know, the really big, strong beers have very little, little head on them. At least I seem like I read that somewhere, heard that somewhere. Now, I don't believe it. Pish posh. Okay, yeah, let's give it a swig out of the old drinking horn. A little bit congested today, but now you can smell the hops in this. Even a uh... yeah, it smells really pleasant. It's not as a uh, citrusy or piney uh, as you might expect from an from an IPA, but you know, just you know, nice, pleasant, uh, mildly hoppy uh, aroma. Let me try a little bit. Oh. That's a great flavor on this one. <laughs> yeah, I remember that one I had last time. And it was kind of watery, frankly. Uh, you know, you had some hops in there, but you know, you could sort of tell it wasn't a a real uh, or it wasn't a you know regular alcoholic beer. You know, the NA <laughs> qualities kind of stood out. Uh, this one, though, uh, I'm not really detecting that. Try it again. Yeah, it's very smooth. I mean, I guess that's probably how you would tell uh, that it's a non-alcoholic. You know, even beers that have, uh, you know, 3 or 4%, you can generally feel a little bit of bite, a little bit of sting uh, going down. So this one, of course, is, uh, you know, completely smooth. Uh, but you do get just enough hoppiness and, and bitterness. Uh, the bitterness is really nice. Uh, I think you need to kind of ratchet up the bitterness a little bit on these. Uh, non-alcoholics to kind of compensate for that lack of uh, alcoholic bite. Now let me try it out of a glass. I mean, this is really good. <laughs> yeah, I think this might be one of the, maybe one of the best ones I've tried. Uh, I still think that Kloss Taylor, uh, the dry hop version of that was just, that, that's going to be hard to beat, I'm starting to think. Uh, but this one is either right up there or maybe even a little bit better. Yeah. Now, this is good stuff. You now you can just, if you really were thinking about it, you know, if I gave you this and a, a regular Sierra Nevada and was like, pick the one that's non-alcoholic, I'm pretty sure you'd be able to tell. Uh, just because, again, this one's so smooth. You know, this is, uh, this is really no more bite to this than you would have to a... Uh, you know, a bottle of uh, sparkling water. <laughs> yeah. So, again, though, uh, what can you do? <laughs> if you want non-alcoholic, you're going to have to make some compromises, I suppose. Uh, but, uh, then again, if I didn't tell you what it was and just gave it to you, I think you would enjoy this. and There would be really no reason to question it. You know, the upshot of this is you, <laughs> you drink three or four and you're still playing. <laughs> you're still having a good time. And of course, you've got nothing to worry about tomorrow morning. <laughs> so that's a pretty big plus, isn't it? Uh, so anyway, uh, uh, again, it's I don't want to pass myself off as an NA expert here. You know, I've probably tried a dozen or so at this point. I will say that this was probably either uh, going to be my number one or number two. So it's 
you know, I, I, <laughs> I might have to bring the Claus Taylor back just so I can do a side-by-side -side comparison. Uh, but wow, this one's really good. I don't think anybody would be disappointed with this one. You know, if you like uh, IPAs, but you, of course, don't want the alcohol for whatever reason, you know, I think this would be a very solid choice. Uh, the Sierra Nevada non-alcoholic IPA, you know, tastes great, smells good. You know, it's got everything but the alcohol. <laughs> so, uh, so definitely check that out. I'd probably go a good four uh, out of five stars on that. You know, again, if we take the non-alcoholic part out and just compare it to all ales, <laughs> it'd be more like a two or a three, but... You know, I'll give it a couple of points for being non-alcoholic. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. And I was, uh, since it's Valentine's Day, or, or was recently, I was looking for quotes about love. And I found a pretty good one from Hussein Nisha, who apparently is known as the Pakistani Beggar King. I don't know what any of that's about, but I like the quote. It goes something like this. You can't put a price tag on love. But if you could, I'd wait for it to go on sale. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> uh, anyway, well, I hope you guys enjoyed that, and I'll see you next time. Whenever he was up in court and the judge used to say occupation, he'd say none. <laughs>